The Westy Chronicles Book 1, The Tale of the Haunted Orchard by V. G. Sims Chapter 1 And so it begins. If you walk up Witch Hill, which is steep and twisted all the way through, you will come to the top of an old apple orchard. It was once very beautiful, well cared for, full of life, and loved as most beautiful things are. But the orchard has been sold to some not-so-nice people. Now the trees grow wild and gnarled. Old apples lie rotting and abandoned by mice and people alike at their twisted bases, and there are plenty of weeds to dig into. It is very windy on top of the hill, and you must walk past the forest of the million eyes. Past that there are two graveyards. One is for young heroes, and the much older graveyard next to it is for old souls. There is a path from there that leads through the orchards, and you can walk into the middle and look way out over the hill. Don't go too far, or you will come upon the old mad scientist's house. It lay abandoned for years, except for the rows of cages in the back. Stay clear of that. If you keep going and finish the circle, you will come to my house. This is where our story begins. My family calls it the Westy Ranch. I am the only Westy there right now, but that's the way I like it. Other dogs are so distracting, sniffing, scratching, growling, peeing on your stuff. I'm the only one here who does that. I let the neighbor's dogs know it too. Hooligans all. The worst is that awful orange tabby cat from next door. He doesn't care. Every night at 4.30 in the morning he comes to my house and pees on the doorstep. He knows I won't annihilate him because my family is sleeping and I need to keep them happy and safe. That's what Ethan would call an opportunist. It's a good human word. Ethan is my best friend. He takes me on walks and feeds me the most. He has some older folks who watch over him, and I'm responsible for them too, but I mostly hang out with him. We make a great team. He likes to be on the computer all day and half the night, and it seems to annoy his parents a bit, but I don't mind. I like it when they're in the same room together, and I can watch over them all. In any case, our story starts in what seemed like an ordinary day. It was November, and the leaves were very bright because of the drought. Fiery colors, orange, yellows, and reds, framed the white sky. The outside animals were scurrying around, trying to gather up stores for the coming days. There was much buzz about whether the winter would be dry, too. I think we were all hoping for snow. I was hanging by a leaf pile, eyeing some annoying chipmunks, when Ethan came crashing out of the house. He had a new toy in his hand. He called it a drone. He was always very excited about his drones and liked to tinker with them for hours on end. I don't mind, because I like to sit at his feet by his workbench and wait for any crumbs that might drop from his snacks. I had just enough time to think about popcorn, one of my favorite snacks, when he came running past me towards the orchard near our house. Gus, come on, he called, running by me in a fury. I'm on duty, I thought, and raced to catch up. We ran up the hill and through some tangled brush, across five rows of apple trees, into the center of one of the orchards. I had to dodge a bit as he kicked old apples in all directions. Clonk! One landed right on my head, but Ethan didn't notice. He was too excited. I was struggling to keep up. We were almost at the spot. There was a clearing where Ethan liked to fly some of his toys from. This drone was quite large, to me anyway. Its wires dangled precariously, and it had an odd metallic smell. I tended to steer clear. It's got a camera on it, said Ethan excitedly. Check this out, Gus. I will be able to see all over the place, across the orchards and beyond. It even has night vision. I growled a little to show my hesitant approval. He took the control panel in both his hands, and zip, up went his toy into the pale autumn sky. He had a phone dangling from around his neck. He would check it periodically and whoop it up. Ethan seemed pretty happy about it, and that made me happy. See, he said, swapping hands to the control panel, I need to find a way to mount the screen on this control panel so I don't have to. Crash! There was a loud noise of collision as the drone nosedived from the sky. I craned my neck up and was just able to make out a large black shadow that dipped and cried out loudly. It made a wide circle in the air above us. I knew immediately it was a hawk. Those birds were the bane of my existence. They flew above our yard, always trying to get at our chickens. This one was bigger than the scrawny hawks that I usually saw. I squinted at the sky. 
You called again. I could just make out a tinkling of bells. Then the creature circled and landed on the shoulder of a girl human, about one hundred paces away from us. She looked over at us, then began walking quickly to where we were. I bristled. I could make out her long scruffy hair under a floppy cap. She had on torn leggings and a canvas jacket. Hey, I'm sorry, is your drone okay? She stopped a few feet ahead of us. Yeah, I think so. Ethan looked down at the fallen beast. Wires and electronic appendages flopped haphazardly on the scratchy earth. He snapped a couple of pieces back together. Why wasn't he mad at her, I thought. I would get yelled at for sure if I ate one of his toys. I moved in closer, unsure of how I was going to protect him. Is that your dog? He's super cute. I watched her approach and stop a couple of feet in front of us. I blinked my eyes and could not believe it. She was carrying a hawk. I'm Eva, and this is my bird Vader. I eyed the beast reluctantly. Ethan smiled. The large predator sat comfortably on her forearm, preening, gloating. He was pretty amazing, large and feathered, with a light head and large clawed feet. His eyes were gold and riveting, and there were bells tied to his toes. He looked at me with suspicion. I held my ground. The girl had a big leather glove on. She tossed a cloth on her shoulder and he climbed up. Gently she put a small hood over his head. Humph! Ethan wouldn't dare do that to me, I mused, my confidence restored. I'm Ethan O'Connor and this is Gus, he said, motioning me towards him. Wow, that is some bird. Do you live around here? Thanks, yes, we just moved in. The wind whistled, and she pushed a curl of golden hair behind her ear. Wow, did you move next door to me? I am at three cobblestone lane. I am at five, yes. Nice to meet you, neighbor. She leaned in to shake his hand. Er, uh, do you go to Hamilton Middle School? Ethan looked down at his feet and kicked an apple. Y yes, I just transferred there last month. Seems okay so far, but I don't know anyone yet. Yeah, it's okay. I can introduce you around. I never met anyone who had a hawk before. Well, I never met anyone with a drone, so it's even. She pulled a dead mouse out of a bag on her side and gave it to the hawk, who gobbled it in one bite. Ethan's eyes widened, but I could tell he was being his usual casual, cool self. I have to get back and put him away. We hunted enough today. Would you like to come to my house and see my other drones? I probably got some cool footage of the crash. Yeah, sounds great. Let me drop off Vader. I will meet you there in ten. Ethan turned and headed back to the house. The bell of the old church in the town square tolled in the distance. We trod methodically between the rows of apple trees. I knew he was pleased because he was singing with his mouth closed as we went. I guess if Eva was his new friend, then she was mine as well. I wasn't too sure about that bird, but time would tell. Chapter 2. There's something going on in Applewood. We ran up the stone steps into the house, and Ethan slammed the door and hurriedly hung up his coat. The kitchen was warm with the pleasant smells of pea soup and apple crisp. His mother was cooking and called out to his dad upstairs. Ethan said hello, and I rubbed my nose along the bottom of her corduroys. She looked down, smiled, and passed me a biscuit. I do love her. They were a great family. There was no time to linger that day, though. There was business at hand. Ethan, Gus, hi, guys. Did you have fun in the orchards? She said, smiling. Hi, Mom. Yes, uh, and we met a new friend, Eva. She's our new neighbor. She's coming over for a bit. Well, that's great. I was hoping there were kids next door. There are cookies on the counter. Thanks, Mom. I took a sip of water while Ethan picked up a plate full of cookies. Chocolate chip. Off limits to me from the counter. He circled back to the front door to let Eva in. I stopped behind him and peered at her from behind his legs. She looked smaller without her bird. Pumpkins and corn husks loomed on both sides of her on the front steps. Hi, Eva. Come on in. Thanks, she said, grinning, and patted me on the head as she stepped into our house. Well, hello there. Miranda O'Connor, Ethan's mom, stepped out of the kitchen to greet Eva. Hello, Mrs. O'Connor. I'm Eva London. We recently moved next door. Well, welcome to the neighborhood. We are so happy to meet you. You are welcome here any time. 
We will have to invite your folks over some night for supper. Eva looked over at Ethan. That would be great. Come on, Eva. Let's go upstairs. I will show you the drones. It was nice meeting you, she called as they moved through the house and up the stairs. A little red head popped out from behind a door in the bright green hallway. It was Ethan's sister, Tess. Her tangled mop of curls was as adorable as her toothless grin. Hi, she called out. They were picking up speed, and I struggled to get ahead of them. Hi there, called Eva over her shoulder. She peeked through some French doors at Ethan's dad working on a computer as they passed. Does everyone in your family have such great red hair? That's my little sister Tess, and yes, I, I guess we do. Have red hair, I mean, he replied. Together they went up to the second floor and then climbed the flight of stairs behind the sliding bookcase to the attic room on the third floor. Wow, this place is amazing. Eva spun in a small circle with her arms out. She was clearly impressed. The attic room spanned the length of the house and was a very fun place to be. Cozy throw rugs and couches were strewn about. Colorful drawings and prints splashed across the beamed walls. Windows on both sides of the room showed two different scenes. One side showed the highway, which was one block over. Cars and trucks buzzed by. It was non-stop action. Conversely, on the opposite side of the room, the windows looked out over acres of picturesque apple orchards, peacefully stretching out as far as the eye could see. It was quite dramatic, according to Ethan's mom. I just love being up so high. It gave me perspective. Westies don't have the longest legs. From the window seat, high up in the attic room, I could see so many of the woodland creatures that lived in the orchard below. Unfortunately, this included that evil neighbor cat, I could see its scrappy tail now, peeking out from under the hydrangea bushes next door, swishing its tail, twitching. It was mesmerizing. Devil. Yeah, it's pretty cool up here, Ethan snatched me from my daydream. No one bothers me, he said. It's mostly off limits to my little sister so my stuff doesn't get broken. Here are the drones and my computer. He motioned to a computer with three separate screens. My dad helped me build this. It's pretty tricked out for gaming and stuff. Cool. I'm not into games too much. I mean, I don't know that much about them. I like living things. Animals. I'm probably going to be a biologist someday. I don't know why I said that. But I love science and technology. Or I, I get it. She plopped down in one of the comfy office chairs and swirled around. Yeah, technology is cool. Here, I can play back the crash. She leaned in to watch. Ethan punched a few keys and pulled up some images on the big screen. It was a playback of the hawk and the drone colliding. They watched it in slow motion several times backwards and forwards. Both laughed when the drone collided with Vader, or vice versa. Feathers were flying everywhere. Oh no! It's hard to tell whose fault it was, Eva laughed. She grabbed a cookie from the plate. I'm glad neither Vader or your drone were hurt. Er, uh, yes, I would call it a no-fault collision. No reason to raise rates, said Ethan. Eva laughed and twirled her chair. She put her sneaked feet up on the sill of the long windows and looked down at the apple trees below, swaying gently in the afternoon breeze. Some black crows flew by the window, oblivious to our presence. So, do you like living here in Applewood? She asked. Yes, it's pretty cool. I like it a lot. I was wondering, have you noticed anything strange about the orchard? Strange, asked Ethan. Yes, odd. She dropped her tone and spoke softer. I noticed it when I first moved in. There are a lot of lights in the sky and over the orchard at night. Sometimes I hear sounds like helicopters and low-flying planes. When I look out, there's nothing there. Sometimes the air smells weird, like something's burning, except I can't see any fires. Hmm, said Ethan, looking serious. And there is that abandoned house in the middle of the orchard. I have seen lights there and in the graveyards as well. But during the day, it looks totally abandoned. I mean, who lives there? Who owns the orchards now? Well, I have noticed those lights myself. It is pretty strange, he agreed. Ethan went over to a bookcase and pulled out a large, thin book. He laid it down on the table. It had pictures of people dressed in clothes that looked like they were from the colonial days. The people looked very serious. They wore dark clothing and stared straight at the camera. The book had some old town maps in it as well. Here, this is where we live. He pointed to the center of the town maps. It was dotted with apple trees. Which hill, gasped Eva. Yes, I have no idea why they called it that, but it is pretty mysterious. 
The orchards have been here for over a hundred years, most of the town orchards and farmland. Wow, I bet it was beautiful, said Eva. She turned to look through the windows. Rows of apple trees sprawled across rolling hills as far as she could see. Houses dotted the edges. She saw a small church steeple in the distance. It still is. And look, there was always this clearing in the middle where that big house is now. There used to be a schoolhouse there, I think. Then it burnt down in a fire, and a huge house was built there in the late 1800s. He gestured to an old black and white picture of a big Victorian house with gables and trellises. The pointed roof pierced the clouds in the old black and white picture. Apple trees surrounded them, and you could just make out one of the graveyards in the distance. Hmm, it looked old, even when it was new. She ran a finger along the edge of the book. Yes, the local kids say a scientist moved in there and went crazy when most of his family died from the Spanish influenza. I think they took him away. The only one left was his youngest son. They say he was a scientist too and did all kinds of experiments on the animals that lived in this orchard. If you go close enough, you can see rows of cages in the back, but I wouldn't go too close. He hasn't been seen in years, but I am not altogether sure he's not still living in the house somewhere. I've seen lights too inside the house and also moving around, rolling back and forth over the orchard at night. I've seen them around the graveyards too. And another thing, he hesitated and pulled up a folder titled Missing Pets. He opened it and pulled out a list of animals. There were several pictures of cats, dogs, and a missing poster with an owl on it. I have been compiling a list. People's pets have been disappearing in the neighborhood. It's fairly recent and troubling to say the least. They both looked down at me. Ethan reached down and pet my head. Did they think I was going to be next? They were quiet for a minute. Eva smiled. I feel an adventure coming on. Adventure? Ethan zipped up his sweatshirt and pulled down his sleeves. What do you have in mind? Well, let's fly one of your drones at night with a camera over the orchard. I bet we can see what's going on, she said. We can find out what the lights are and maybe even catch a glimpse of the mad scientist. Hmm, Ethan paused for a moment. He liked to think things through. I guess we could do that. A couple of my drones have night vision. I can fly them in the dark for stealth missions. I even have a tiny camera we could fit on Vader for another perspective. If you guys are up to it. Yes, let's do it, Eva cried. How about later tonight? It's still the beginning of the long weekend and all. The lights usually come later in the evening. Okay, can you see the lights from your house? Text me when they come out and I'll meet you outside your backyard. That way we can minimize our outside time in case our folks get nervous. What's your cell? Here's mine. Got it, thanks. Smiley face, Eva texted. Well, I guess I'll see you later. She got up and made her way to the door. I heard her feet clumping down the stairs. I looked over at Ethan. He was lost in thought, planning something, no doubt. I hopped up to the window and looked out over the apple trees. They swayed gently in the breeze. Several rows on one side had been cut down. Gnarled branches and weeds lay in piles, ready to be burned, no doubt. I dropped my gaze and peered down into Ava's backyard. I saw her run across the yard and disappear into the back porch. I scanned the hydrangeas. The cat was gone. Things were about to get interesting. Chapter 3 A Moonlight Night Comes to an End That night, the golden autumn moon was almost full. It was windy and the leaves crunched underfoot as Ethan and I made our way as quietly as we could through the back path leading to Eva's house. I could make out some orange lights up in the sky, circling and moving through the clouds in a grid-like pattern across the darkness. We walked uphill along the edge of the orchard to get to Eva's house. Being a Westie and good at my job, it was hard to stay focused with the many eyes of the night creatures upon us as we made our way up the path and through the woods. Their eyes shone brightly from all around the woodland path. A desperate chipmunk darted across the path and grabbed an acorn. I had more important things to do than chase after him. 
A large black crow sat on the top of Eva's house. It was devouring some small animals that looked like mice or maybe small bats. I could see their desperate movements in the night shadows. Ethan didn't notice. It sure was spooky on that first night of our adventure. I had a sense of foreboding. That is, I felt like something was about to happen, the same way your mouth waters a bit when one of your owners brings out a treat. You think you may be getting it, but you're not quite sure either. Ethan sent her a text and we sat down on the ground to wait. The moon shone brightly through the clouds. A solitary owl hooted in the distance. Hello. We both jumped. Eva had come up behind us in the brush. Sorry, I wanted to get something from the shed first. She reached up and put the very large bird on her shoulder. He looked bigger and somehow less friendly than before. Vader loves to hunt at night, although usually not too late. She shrugged and he took off, flew up and landed on Eva's roof. It was a colonial house like ours, a new house that looked old. He swooped down and effortlessly took away whatever bounty the large crow had been eating. Reak! The crow called out mournfully and flew into the trees. It knew it had been beaten. Vader remained a minute on the roof, eating his prey. The moonlight shone on his eyes. He turned his silver head, which acted like a spotlight, and gazed at us. One thing was for sure, that bird had charisma. He swooped down noiselessly and landed on Eva's forearm. Wow, said Ethan, that is quite a bird. Yeah, he is very strong and a good friend. Okay, let's go. We all agreed and walked the remaining yards to the orchard. We stopped at the no trespassing sign. It had fallen into the weeds. Ethan paused to read it. No hunting or trespassing at any times. Violators will be prosecuted courtesy of Doton Properties, LLC. He propped it back up. Those are the guys that bought the orchards. We're waiting to see what they are going to do, but it doesn't look good. I heard they were going to cut all the orchards down and put in an outlet mall. That's pretty horrible. I mean, what is going to happen to all the animals that live here, said Eva. I had heard Ethan's folks talking about it at dinner one night. I remembered the worry in their voices. They were afraid the developers would take our house. I remember thinking at the time about all the animals that would have to move away. Some would surely be too little or old and frail to make it. I would show those developers what's what if I ever got within close enough range. I hopped over the brush and followed my friends. They said the builders were even planning to bring the highway closer. I heard a truck rumble. An owl hooted in the distance. I could make out the shadows of the old graveyard in the background. I knew there was a family of turkeys hiding behind the stones. I looked up and saw one sitting in a pine tree above us as we walked by. It blinked a big googly eye at me. I didn't say anything though, poor things. They weren't the brightest creatures and it was almost turkey season. I was grateful I had a house to live in and a family who loved me. We walked along quietly and stopped before the clearing. The air smelled crisp and cool, like fall and apples and wood smoke. Let's set up here, said Ethan. He knelt and unpacked some equipment. Okay, can I help with anything? Eva asked. No thanks, it will just take a sec, he said and unwrapped two of his drones from a canvas bag. I think I will fly two tonight and get footage from the orchard and over the scientist's house. I am going to attach the small drone camera to Vader's foot. It has night vision and video capabilities. That should give us a totally different perspective. Also, I won't have to control two at the same time. Sounds good. You can attach it here by the bells. She gently turned Vader's talon. That tells me where he is in case I lose him on a hunt. She turned and pointed up at the sky. That's where I saw the lights about a half hour ago. They were near the top of the orchard, almost to the old church. Together we scanned the night sky. There was a faint sulfuric smell in the air. Suddenly a plane flew overhead, casting an orange glow from its lights and leaving behind a trail of white smoke. The smoke streamed and expanded into the cool air. I'm not sure about Ethan and Eva, but I felt dizzy all of a sudden. My feet were tingling. It was the strangest feeling. My head felt light, like it was floating above my body. For a moment, my vision blurred. I shook my head from side to side. What was happening to me, I thought. Are you okay, old man? Ethan said, looking down at me. I must have stumbled a bit, but I gave him a short growl to let him know not to baby me. Okay, let's get these birds in flight. Right, whispered Eva, and threw up her arm. 
both bird and drone went up into the night sky. As if on cue, some lights appeared from behind the church square. A plane emerged flying low on the horizon. Pale orange lights shone from the control panels, but it was otherwise black. It flew past the orchards and into the surrounding neighborhoods, and then back up forming a linear pattern. Pale white lines faded into the clouds on the horizon. The plane turned and headed our way. Ethan's drone was still close to us, but Vader had flown over the old mansion. The last thing I remember was the plane flying overhead and their voices sounding far away and muffled. I awoke in the attic room. Ethan's face was very close to mine. He must have carried me back home. My head was swimming. I jumped out of his arms and off the couch. Shakily, I stood up. Gus, you're back. You had me scared. Here, drink some water. He pushed my water dish at me. I took a sip listlessly. Daylight hit me like a jerk of a choke collar. I winced. The sun was just beginning to rise on the eastern edge of the orchard. It was starting to stream freely in through the windows and making my head ache. Easy now, he said, looking concerned. I looked around. Where was Eva and Vader? She came around the couch and pet me on the head. I think he will be all right. Poor Gus. You're safe now. She pet me warmly and scratched my ears. I love how he has one ear that goes up and the other down. So, what's going on? Do you have Vader's footage? It's not like him not to come back right away when I call. Hopefully this sheds some light on the subject. This is the footage from the camera on his foot, he said. Ethan sat down next to me on the couch. We all stared up at the screen. Together we watched Vader take off into the night from his perspective. Flying up into the clouds, the edges of his wings were visible. We could see out over the orchards from Vader's point of view. He turned back, and we could see ourselves crouching on the edge of the orchard. Ethan sent a drone off in the direction of the plains, and the hawk continued forward and banked left into the middle of the orchard. He approached the house. There was a light flickering in the second-story window. It looked like, perhaps, a candle. A plane flew overhead and left a gray cloud that drifted down, covering the camera's lens. Suddenly, Vader seemed to be losing altitude. The house rose up, and the next thing we saw was the underside of an old porch railing. The door opened slowly, and a person stepped out. Eva drew in an audible breath. We all froze. The camera stopped at a man's knees, but when he bent down to pick up Vader, we caught a glimpse of his dark, almond-shaped eyes and a handlebar mustache, like the kind in that French detective series Ethan's mom and I like to watch on Sundays. He looked at the camera for a second. I felt like he could see us. Who is that? whispered Ethan. Is Vader okay? There were tears in Eva's eyes. Ethan reached over and squeezed her hand. I put my head on her ankle. Their eyes were glued to the screen. The man looked at the camera, then pulled off the bells. The last thing we saw was a shot of the sky and the big harvest moon, and then blackness. He must have tossed the camera away. We have to go back. Did he do something to hurt Vader? The same thing that made Gus pass out? Eva jumped off the couch. I'm not sure. Wait, let's look at the footage from the drone, said Ethan. With the click of a button, we were seeing the orchard from a different view. I sat back on the couch and watched the huge screen. The planes came swooping in from above. I saw myself fall into the weeds and Ethan stopped to pick me up. My paws dangled and he pulled me to his chest. He had the most horrified look on his face. My heart twinged. Vader took off over the house and then nosedived into some old rose bushes next to the scientist's porch. The clouds from the plane descended around us. Hey, said Eva, I don't think the guy in the house hurt Vader. It was those guys in the plane. What were they spraying? No idea, but it hurt our pets for sure. He knelt and gave me a piece of popcorn. I took it as usual. I think Gus is okay, but what they did has to be illegal and unsafe. Well... We have to go back and get Vader. How do we protect ourselves from the fog? I have these. He went to a cabinet and pulled out two gas masks. Sorry, buddy. You are staying here, at least until we figure out what's going on. He reached over and scratched my neck. I don't know what I would do if something happened to you. Should we tell your folks? Eva went over to the windowsill and peered down at the yard, just as Ethan's mom and Tess got in the car to go on errands. I knew his dad had left to go on his weekend jog. That could take a while. I shook my head. It's daytime now. I will text to them 
where we are going. Let's head on over and ask for Vader. I will keep my camera on for security. There's one for you too, he said, motioning to Eva. Gus, you can man the couch and watch the video. Run down and grab the folks if anything goes wrong. I looked up at him and nodded my shaky head. Nothing would stop me. Chapter 4 The Professor's Lair I watched from home on the big screen as the two friends approached the old gray house and knocked loudly on the door. They both had gas masks on and looked fairly odd, to say the least, like big walking bugs. Ethan pulled off his mask. He was in rare form. I had never seen him look so determined. I wished I could be there to protect them both. No one answered. He knocked again and tried the old copper doorknob. It creaked open. He looked over at Eva. She had on a little camera too, and I could see her perspective on the bottom right of my screen. She reached past him and opened the door. With a bang, it flew open. Eva walked right in, grabbing Ethan's hand behind her. With trepidation, Ethan followed her into the house. It was poorly lit, and it looked old and dusty. Old brown furniture and boxes littered the room. Old drapes with tears and stains covered the windows. It looked unlived in and unwelcoming. A thick layer of dust covered everything. Eva pulled off her mask. It looks like no one has lived here in years. She wrinkled her nose. Smells musty. Hello, Ethan called. The house seemed dark, with old clothes draped across furniture that was strewn about in a haphazard way. They walked past an old staircase. A light shone from under a door built into it. Down there, she said, pointing at the door. He reached ahead and tested the knob, turning it softly to and fro. It was open. He looked at Eva. She nodded. Slowly he turned it again and opened the door. Immediately they were bathed in light. Ethan and Eva squinted and looked down a long hallway. The floor sloped downward gradually, then turned a corner. They hesitated. There was no telling what or who they would find, or how much danger they were in. Let's go, said Eva. Vader could be in trouble. Ethan nodded, and they proceeded. Their faces gleamed with amazement by what they saw. There was a bright light shining all around them. It was like being outside on a sunny day. The walls had life-size images of the orchards projected somehow onto them. This was in huge contrast from the creepy interior of the house. Ethan blinked his eyes and looked up at the ceiling. But there was none. Above them, blue sky and fluffy clouds floated by. What is this? he exclaimed. Do you feel the breeze? It even smells like the orchard down here. Suddenly, the pictures on the walls changed. There were pictures of all of us running through the orchards, with me and Vader before we got separated. This was followed by pictures of Eva and Ethan running to the front door. Then they were walking through a tunnel with videos of themselves on the walls. It made my head spin to watch. This is creepy, exclaimed Eva, craning her head back and forth as she moved. Rick! It was the bird. Vader, I hear him, she cried. They ran down the incline and around the corner to find themselves in a huge room. They must have been underground, under the old house. The room was quite long and covered on both sides with shelves and shelves of books and beautiful oil paintings. There were two long tables with laboratory equipment on them. The windows were projections of the orchard that reached up to the soaring copper ceiling. It was amazing. There was a long wooden table and workbench and a leather chair facing a roaring fireplace. There was a large man in the chair facing the fire, and on the back of the chair was the bird. Vader, cried Eva. She ran ahead. Vader turned and flew to her shoulder. He looked into her eyes and chirped, clearly happy to see her. She hugged him and sighed. It was wonderful. Ethan moved ahead. Who are you? And what did you do to our pets? Ethan, exclaimed Eva. I should be asking you that, Ethan, except I already know. The man got up from the chair and slowly turned around. He was tall and old. He had wrinkles around his eyes, which twinkled with amusement, and a small curled mustache, which quivered when he spoke. You are Ethan O'Connor. You live with your mom, dad, sister Tess, 
dog Gus and an odd assortment of chickens at 3 Cobblestone Lane. You have a penchant for drones and all things electronic. He turned to Eva and smiled. You are Eva London. Having recently moved here with your folks, your beautiful hawk and a very large, somewhat disagreeable cat, you live next door to Ethan. I have seen you both wandering around in my orchards, er, but really I don't mind. I heard you sold them, said Eva, moving closer to him with her beloved bird back on her shoulder. Well, I did sell many acres, unfortunately. I was trying to find a way to pay off the taxes and buy back some more of the land when some big shots moved in and bought it overnight. I just have this one acre of land in the middle, but they're trying to get that from me as well. Ethan eyed him with distrust and scanned the room. His eyes fell on the workbench, littered with gadgets and electronics. I didn't hurt your animals, by the way. They did. They dropped some kind of tranquilizer from the air. From my calculations, they have been doing it for months. It's dangerous for the wildlife and highly illegal. If no one acts, they will do a lot worse than make our house pets groggy. Hoot! Hoot! They both jumped. There was a large gray owl sitting on one of the old bookcases. They hadn't even noticed. It blinked its gigantic golden eyes at them, then turned its head unnaturally around. Yes, that's Herodotus. I also call him H. He looked over at Vader. I am a sucker for birds of prey. Eva walked forward and shook the man's hand. Well, thank you for helping my bird. I'm sorry for coming into your house without being invited. You're welcome. I don't have many visitors, but I am glad to meet you. Ethan felt something run across his foot and looked down. A rust-colored woodchuck the size of Eva's cat scurried across the room and jumped onto the leather chair. Ah, yes, that is Ari. He lives with me as well. I am a biologist. I like to rehabilitate some of the orchard animals that need my help before I set them free again. Ari was curious about everything here and refused to go back to the wild. The orchard isn't as hospitable as it used to be. Many of his friends aren't making it lately, I'm afraid. With the clearing of the land, there is less food and water for them. Their ecosystem has been disrupted. He gazed out the projected windows. A helicopter flew by in the distance. The children looked up in time to see a small group of barn swallows fly across the ceiling. A huge fish tank bubbled in the corner. A creature resembling an octopus scurried behind an amazing chunk of white coral. The place was teeming with life. And your name is? queried Eva. Professor Winter Maddock, Ph.D., read Ethan out loud off a framed diploma perched precariously on a bookshelf. You can call me W for short, said the professor agreeably. Poor Professor W, said Eva, smiling. Stay for lunch, and I will fill you in on the goings-on around here. I'm at a quandary. That is, I really don't know what to do. Well, we can't stay long. I want to check on Gus. He was still a little out of sorts when we left. Of course, said the professor. Here is your drone, by the way. He also handed back the small camera that had been tied to Vader's foot. Thanks, said Ethan. In all the excitement, he had forgotten about his equipment. I made a little modification to it. Hope you don't mind. It now has a homing beacon, so you can find it if it gets lost again. Wow, thanks, said Ethan, smiling. Or uh, maybe we could stay a bit longer. I would like to know what's going on around here. Yes, interjected Eva. We have been noticing strange lights at night in the orchards, and many of the pets and orchard animals have been disappearing. I was wondering what was happening to them. It's not just a question of what, but of who, said the professor, opening up two local newspapers. Engelbert Kettlebaum and his right-hand man, Pierre LeFou, owner and chief planner of Doan Enterprises, LLC, leered up at them from the tattered pages. Who are those guys, asked Eva, coming in for a closer look. Those are the ones who bought the orchards. They told the town they were going to put up some nice senior centers, a whole retirement community with golf courses and community centers. The town okayed the plans, but they had other designs for the land. He tossed another paper down on the table. In the picture, Kettlebaum was shaking hands with an equally creepy looking man. He had small rounded teeth and a big rounded head. His pants were hanging low. It was amazing that gravity did not finish them off. The foo frowned in the shadows of the photo. 
His black ponytail was streaked with white and slicked back from his equally shiny and impossibly high forehead. He had beady-looking eyes, and his skinny, hairless arms fell away from his biker short, which had an Illuminati symbol in the middle of it. He looked angry and hungry. Kettlebum looked like he had eaten too much, but could probably eat more. He was grinning like the Cheshire cat. I have read about them, said Ethan. What's their plan? I believe it's this. Professor W. leaned in and put a tablet next to Ethan. Tower Industries Pipeline Project? Yes. Fossil fuels are the energy of the past, and now, unfortunately, the future for Applewood. Anyway, a pipeline right through the orchards in our neighborhood? No way, cried Eva. Way. Ethan gasped as he scanned through the company's projected project. But pipelines always fail. It's dirty energy. What would happen if it leaked into the orchard? I thought the town was committed to green energy. That's a ruse, just like Kettlebum's building plans. Everything about these guys is crooked, said the professor. Here, see, they changed the town government rules about building developments, then took a payoff and paved the way for unethical folks to come in and profit. They're planning on taking a bunch of the surrounding houses under eminent domain laws. Unfortunately, that is your house, my house, and most of the surrounding neighborhood. How awful! I love it here! What a huge loss! exclaimed Ethan. To us and all the animals, said Eva, looking out at the projected orchard, then down at the black crosses on the table, marking out their houses. It's such a great place to live. There's so much life here. I wish there was a way to fix this. Well, there is always room for change when something hasn't happened yet, suggested the professor. The key is taking immediate action. Eva turned and walked to the fireplace. There were multiple framed pictures and works of art. An older painting depicted a tall and striking Indian chief standing on a cliff. He was clothed in buckskin and his headdress was large and colorful. His powerful arms were raised to the sky and storm clowns rayed down on the valley below. Who is that, she said. Why, that's Chief Passaconaway. He was a powerful Native American chief and ruled the lands from the lower valley up to the White Mountains. He was a great warrior and sorcerer, before we took his land, that is. It is said he could control the weather and call up fire as well as storms. He had lands in the area and enjoyed hunting here close to Witch Hill. He tried to warn his people of the settlers' greed, but they outsmarted the natives and took their land. So interesting, she mused. I loved hearing about the people that came before us. Yes, it seems he had some control over the weather. There's some folk stories that report he called up bursts of powerful winds and thunderstorms to stop some minor skirmishes in the area, said the professor. He ultimately lost to the settlers, but his fight was won against many. Hmm, murmured Ethan. He rotated the drone in his hands and looked up at the clouds. Maybe we could try our hand at that before the two become many. The clouds and the plains, said Eva. They drop chemicals into the clouds. That's how they tranquilized our animals. That is so harsh. What will they do to us? They're trying to control us, remarked the professor. They don't care how they do it. Kettlebum and LeFou need the town's approval to take control of the orchard land and put in their pipeline. I think they are planning on poisoning the whole town with that stuff to make the people more compliant, more ready to sign the papers. I think they are interested in fast profits and moving on, with none of the safety protocols in place to protect the community, the environment, or the animals. What if we control the weather, said Ethan. What? Both the professor and Eva said simultaneously. Professor, how do we get our hands on 100 gallons of soap suds? I think I'm getting a plan.